Welcome. Hello, everyone. Welcome to webinar five. And thank you every time to the Wyoming State Survey Agency and CMS for approving this three year grant to try to bring lots of education uh, regarding culture change. And because we try to be flexible and uh, helpful to everybody, uh, and we're living in a pandemic, which has a lot of challenges, um, we were asked to try to share ideas for retention and recruitment. And so here we go. We're gonna focus on employee councils and quite a number of other ideas for you to consider as you're doing everything you can to hold on to good people uh, that we need desperately. So I'm just gonna uh, let you know every culture change idea I've ever heard, but we're gonna first start with employee councils. And by the way, just in general, um, you know, we have 20 years of a culture change movement and the leading pioneer homes uh, always showed a decrease in turnover and also an increase in, in longevity. So just in general, changing institutional culture making it more of a home family for everyone, including those who work there, has tended to really pay off. And so I share that with you in general. Um, I hope it makes sense. And I hope today is, is helpful to you. And then a lot of these ideas are also reflected in the Artifacts of Culture Change tool. Many, those of you that are in the project, the five homes every year are asked to fill out the Artifacts tool and pick three artifacts, three practices to work on through the whole year uh, implementing. And so this tool, I just want you to see, came out in 2006 and it was funded by CMS. I was very fortunate to be a subcontractor. So it's been around that long. And then during the pandemic of all times, it started before, before the pandemic, we've been working on a 2.0 version as well as the first ever assisted living version. And um, these are available at the Pioneer Network website, that is pioneernetwork.net. And I do highly recommend, go get your own copy, consider looking at it as a team. It really is reflective of what a change culture looks like. And there are five different sections um, from resident life to employee engagement. And so some of these ideas come out of that, including artifact number 134, that's the last one on the nursing home tool that there is an employee council or something equivalent that does meet routinely to help discuss, you know, anything employees need discussed, but also plan events, provide support, et cetera. So what could an employee council do? All of the above. Um, uh, let's see, events that, you know, just um, are interesting to people, meet their needs. Uh, what are their needs, what, what things need to be talked about, issues. Um, I've heard, as an example, uh, creating a welcoming culture for employees' children. How wonderful is that? Um, also, you know, encouraging friendships with one another. Good stuff. So on that note, I want to um, introduce, and really, Desiree, would you please introduce yourself more uh, it, on purpose? Like, please tell everyone exactly your position. And Desiree Bishop is now going to share with us um, the, the use of councils in her work at the Cheyenne uh, Living Center. So Desiree, thank you for joining us and doing this today. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm here at the long-term care wing of the VA here in Cheyenne. And we're a 42 bed uh, facility that does long-term care. We do hospice, we do some respite, some transitional. Um, so we kind of play a lot of different roles. We are connected to the hospital, which does allow us, it's kind of nice. It does give us a little more um, resources with the VA. And, you know, like all of you, we're all struggling out there with staffing. This has become quite the challenge. You know, we put out um, certifications, trying to get people hired. And it's amazing how the number has decreased and the number of staff that I get applying. So keeping my staff and attempting to improve that is certainly uh, very much on our radar here at the VA and definitely at the CLC. So, you know, when we do, the VA does these surveys once a year, we call them the all employee survey and routinely communication and kind of that feeling of, you know, just 
helplessness, that lack of empowerment is something that we routinely see. Now here at the Cheyenne VA, we do have a nurse practice council that is on the inpatient side that CLC does participate in, but it's almost more of a policy council um, as far as nursing policy and things that nursing think need to be in policy. So when I looked at this last year, um, I really wanted a place where employees had a chance to really drill down on issues and things that were affecting them and really wanted to have a voice in. So that included, you know, fall policies, fall interventions, um, you know, how can we do better practices? Because I often hear people complain as far as, hey, you know, this isn't working, but I wasn't getting a lot of ideas. And I think part of it was they just didn't feel able, you know, there just wasn't a set process to bring those ideas forward. Certainly they were a little discouraged. And so what I did is the end of last year, then I really set out um, to try to do some research. Um, I didn't want to reinvent the wheel. This was something new to me. I served, served on councils, but I had never built one. Um, so I set out and just kind of looked through a lot of research out there, looked at some people who had done it successfully. Um, UCLA has a great structure for shared governance. Um, and so kind of just took ideas from different places to build it. You know, I think if you're looking at doing something like this, again, don't reinvent the wheel. People have done this successfully. Go out there, look at ideas and charters and kind of pull what's applicable and what you think would work in your situation. You know, our goal with doing this was really, again, staff empowerment, staff engagement, you know, feeling like that communication improved and just a feeling of job satisfaction and really being able to meet the employees where they felt the needs were versus being more management driven, which is what's been historical. Um, a lot of these ideas are geared towards our veterans or, you know, where whatever situation you may be in, but here geared towards our veterans and really a lot of those ideas that we are encouraging them to take on really do have a direct impact on safety, um, both for staff and for veterans. And again, you know, this really, we were looking at increasing staff buy-in, um, really to get them, you know, they've heard over and over, you need to do this, you need to do this, you need to do this, you know, really trying to give it back to them and saying, okay, this is where we need to be. What does staff think is the best way to get there? Um, you know, again, we've, you know, this last year, again, has been so hard and just very, you know, stressful, so we've certainly seen just an increase in frustration and we were really looking to change that work culture. Um, so again, just giving them a voice. I think people just feel so much more satisfied if they feel like they've at least been heard and a chance to offer input. And again, we're looking to improve that all employee survey, you know, actually reflecting that work culture change, improving retention, you know, that we're not losing that staff when it's so critical and also reducing call offs, you know, reducing those times when um, we're really struggling. Next slide. Mm -hmm. So we really tried to tie our back, you know, tie back into the VA mission, vision, and values as far as, you know, what were the things that we wanted them to focus on and also to be their guiding light in their decision making. You know, if you can make your decisions based on your organization's mission, vision, and values as long as that decision adheres to those, you probably are headed in the right direction. Management, you know, as management, I helped, I did the research, I helped build it. I went out and I, you know, found people that I thought would be effective and interested um, to really, you know, start to build this with me. And once I got them going and got their charter going, I let it go, okay? Um, I want it to be a place, and I think, historically, they have been a place where really it is employee driven. I'm not there to tell them what they can and can't do. When they have developed that project, they then bring it to management and say, hey, this is what we want to do. This is why we think it'll work. You know, here's the evidence behind it. This is how we would roll it out. You know, this is what we think it would lead to. Um, so really, you know, again, just really turning that decision over to them. I think it's important that your managers are as enthusiastic about it as your employees. 
if you have a council that's really fired up, but they're not getting that feedback from their manager, I think your council will not be successful. So I think it's really important that you educate your managers on the possibilities. This can basically grow as much as you want it to grow, um, you know, as long as those employees re receive encouragement and feedback. And, you know, again, support. Obviously not all ideas are feasible based on, you know, whether it's financial, whether it's resources, um, but again, being able to communicate that with your staff um, so that maybe this is a great idea. We can't do it the way you think because of X, Y, and Z. But if you account for that, maybe we can go in a direct, another direction and still accomplish that. So really giving them that feedback, you know, also having them report regularly. You know, our council then tries to report once a month. And then if they have additional things that, you know, they have a project they're working on that they would like to move forward with, they will schedule a time with management. But again, you know, you don't want anything to flounder and kind of die. So, you know, checking in with, you know, your council, having them routinely report work kind of helps everyone stay on task and what the goal of this council would be. And I think, again, just being enthusiastic. If you don't believe in it, no one else is going to either. Next slide. So I, you know, if, did my research, I talked to my team members, I went to my leadership, they were all on board with this, um, and I rolled it out in January. And so, you know, in the beginning, we met twice a week, just as we were developing a charter that the council would operate within. And that charter, you know, I went out and found some great examples from UCLA and a couple other places. And really, that charter then just governs them as far as you know, who they report to, how often they're going to meet, what's the composition of the council. You know, in our case, it's, we did not do a nurse council. We actually took all members that work within our unit. Um, and so we have our CNAs on there. We have our nurses, you know, we've encouraged restorative, you know, all of these people then to have a say, um, because of course, all the projects they work on certainly need that input from those various disciplines. So it's certainly not geared towards nursing or someone else. We really want it to be a collaborative effort. At this point, they meet monthly and then they meet individually with whatever projects they're working on. So, you know, one of the projects they were working on was we were lacking a real consistency in how um, resident weights were managed as far as you know, some people did it this way and some people, it wasn't always on the same scale, wasn't always at the same time of day. And so they've really worked to come up with a consistent plan that they feel they can all meet um, and overcome some of those ideas versus management just saying, hey, you're gonna do it this way. They've really said, okay, here's why we don't do it the way we should. What things can we do to work on that? Um, they also report to the Nurse Practice Council. Um, they tie in any SOPs or anything that they help develop on those processes, like the weight management. I will say we have seen, um, before the implementation, we were really struggling with some of the work culture as far as just people feeling burned out, you know, no communication, just that lack of a voice. And I will say I have seen a huge improvement in just work attitude um, and just feeling like they feel they can come up to management and say, hey, I think this is a great idea. What do you think? Um, so I do certainly think it's increased that communication and given them a chance to really work for stuff. And actually I've seen a huge boost as far as CNAs on the council, really feeling like they can come forward and suggest change. So we really have, you know, I mean, it's still in its infancy. We're only, you know, eight months in, but have definitely seen some positives. Um, and again, I think the sky's the limit as far as where you can take this. It, the key is gonna be sustainability. You know, just it's, you can get people to roll it out, but keeping people excited about it and keeping management as engaged as employees, I think is key. Beautiful. Thank you, Desiree. Yeah, I think we might have a question. Courtney, uh, did you have your hand up? <laughs> Courtney, Courtney, and can you unmute yourself? I hope. Uh, I'm looking, guys. Uh -uh. 
Courtney. Can you put in the chat, in the chat box? Hmm. Sorry, guys. Uh, bear with me. This is fun to hear from her. Was it Courtney? Courtney. All right, I don't see her. Uh, Courtney, if you're there, here we go, guys. Uh, Desiree. <laughs> they're saying hello okay maybe they were just going to say hello i have a question everybody if you have a question for desiree please ask it um let's see desiree is is the council a set group like a team that meets together or is it sort of like resident council where you know anyone's invited to come to the meeting employee council meeting but there's also a core team I, i'm curious about that so it's actually a set group, but at any time staff can nominate somebody to go on and staff actually votes on people on. It's not something where the council okay. controls membership. Okay. The entire, all the employees then have a say in who's on that council. And if they express interest, certainly it's something they can join. We do, they, I think the charter does limit it to like 10 members just so that there is kind of that group. They also are on there essentially for a term to encourage that, hey, there's always old blood, but we're always bringing in new blood as well mm -hmm. to try to encourage you know, all employees to really take a turn at it and you know, have a chance to really see what change they, th they can do. You bet, wonderful. Hey, Desiree, God bless you. That, that was really great to learn about that. And Thank you for sharing, and I'm sure everyone's getting some ideas. So uh, feel free to ask Desiree a question if it still comes to everybody. And with that, we're going to move on to another employee council I'm familiar with. I've done some count, uh, consulting with this group, Cherry Creek Care Center. It's in Aurora, Colorado. Um, here's what I know about it from, from my historical uh, knowledge of, of these guys. <laughs> they ended up um, trying it two years ago, and I'm happy to say they still have it going, even through COVID. It was hit and miss, I guess, but um, they're very good at asking employees what they need, and you're about to hear more about this because I did a, a quick interview with the lead person today over Zoom. Here's a plus for Zoom. You can record it, and you can put it right in your PowerPoint. How cool is that? Um, one idea I, I heard from someone else they're working on <laughs> It's turning an old med cart into a in, into a wonderful array of food and snacks to bring around to employees. They've done backpacks at the start of school for employees' kids. Uh, they did a bring your child to work day. Oh, so cool! And they've they've for many years had a kudos comment board. So just sharing some ideas that I know of there. And here we go. Uh, Michelle wanted to be on with us today, but guess what? Guess what she has right now? Her employee council right now. So she couldn't make it. We did this earlier. So here we go. Well, hello, Michelle Bernal. Uh, welcome. And thank you so much for um, being so kind to teach us what you know about employee councils. So everyone, Michelle, can you please give your history, your title, where you work, and then we'll just jump in. Tell us about your employee council, please. Thank you. Sure, sure. So I'm Michelle. I work here at Cherry Creek Nursing Center. Um, currently, I work as the payroll AP coordinator, um, but I also previously have worked here as a social worker and as a CNA. So I've had a little bit of background in different areas, and um, I'm kind of using the knowledge and experience in each of those areas to continue moving, um, moving forward and seeing what, what I can learn and engage from other staff and residents to make changes. Wonderful. Uh, yeah. Um, and so we started our employee council probably about two years ago, and we get together every month. We try to get together every month. Sometimes people's schedules kind of fluctuate, and so that does change. Um, but we get together every month with the intent of discussing any questions or concerns that staff might have, addressing any needs of the staff, and also to plan um, employee appreciation events. So um, some of the employee appreciation events we've had before, um, we set up like a large uh, 
what baked potato bar and just had different toppings. So staff could come in, they can pick their baked potato, pick different toppings, pick some different goodies and drinks and things like that. Um, and the leadership team help hands those out so that the employees know that we do appreciate them because sometimes just hearing a simple thank you can make a really big difference in people's day. Wonderful. Hey, yeah. Michelle, what are some other things you've done besides the baked potato bar? I bet there are numerous. Oh yeah, so we've done walking taco bars, we've done coffee bars, the iced coffee bars seem to be a really big hit. Um, we had previously, we had a, a oh. DON whose family, whose family owned um, an ice cream truck. And so they brought the ice cream truck out front and we let all the employees and residents pick whatever kind of ice cream, you know, they wanted. And so that was pretty cool. Um, and so, yeah, just different things. Uh, I usually go around and I ask the staff or I put up a flyer that says, hey, we want to do something for employee appreciation. What kind of goodies are you guys feeling like enjoying this time? You know, we've had people say, well, we want something healthy this week. So we've done parfaits and salad bars, or we just want sweets. And so we did a whole smorgasbord of different treats and brownies and cinnamon rolls and cookies and things like that. Um, so, yeah. It's my understanding, Michelle, in talking to you and Dean, that you really do a lot of asking, what do you need and what do you want? Is that yes. true? Yes. A lot um, of asking. That's a good, can you speak to that? Yeah. Uh -huh. I, I'm a firm believer in just asking people. I feel like um, everyone has different opinions and different thoughts and what I feel might fit better isn't always going to be the case for everybody. Um, my desires and my preferences are different than other people's and so I feel strongly that asking people what their preferences are and having different ideas, especially because our facility is so culturally diverse, um, is really beneficial to what our purpose is and what we're trying to do. Nice job. Preferences, you know, preferences show up in the regs for, for residents more than ever before and you're reflecting that. The people yes. Who work there nice job yeah. yeah and i i have very strong preferences especially when it comes yeah. to things like food and so yeah. i know yeah. if it if it might not work for me it might not work for someone else so yeah yeah beautiful how, how about pros and cons michelle if i were to ask what are the, some pros or some cons I, if there are any for sure. council um, so one of the things that we've started to do within the last couple months is um, our facility does pinnacle survey reviews every, uh, I want to say quarter, um, and we go through those together as a leadership team and as the employee council team. So whether the comments are good or bad, we review them. And we use those as our opportunities for improvement, our opportunities for growth. So if there are things that people have concerns about, we look at that and we say, well, what can we do to help foster um, more improvement in those situations? Mm -hmm. um, so that's very beneficial. I think that that's a pro is being able to sit down as a team and look at the things we've done well and the things we've done wrong, because it's important to understand how to change what we're doing. What what we don't feel we're doing right or what other people don't feel we're doing right. Mm -hmm. um, the only con I think to that is that sometimes staff don't want to engage in the meetings. And so um, I think having a larger group with staff of different variations and different more variations in departments would be a, a more beneficial as well. Because we do have, you know, our business office comes, social work, our leadership team and um, just having more nursing staff available that would like to join in would be mm -hmm. would be better. And, and Michelle, you mentioned um, employee council team. So yep. is there really a council and is there really a team or are, are we talking the same thing? It's the same thing. Yeah, yeah. it's okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's the same thing. Our employee council, it, we're working together. We're working cohesively for the same goal. And so that it's why I say team a lot. It's it's, it's all cohesive for the same for the same outcome is what we're looking for. So Michelle, in my mind, like you know how there's resident council and anyone can come. Yes. Do you do that? Like we're having an employee council meeting for all employees who can come, but then there's also a leadership team, kind of like a resident council officers. Is, is yes. Okay. Yes. Um, we have done that in the past. 
through COVID, it was a little bit harder because it was harder to have, you know, more people in the building and everybody in the same room. And so we're starting to open it back up to having it focused on um, with leadership and then having larger availability for all of the staff as well. Um, one of the things I know that we had talked about previously was just increasing our communication outwards. And so we have a system called Voice Friend that sends text messages or phone calls out to um, whoever we selected to go out to. And so we, you know, can send out messages to all the staff just saying, hey, we're having this meeting at this time, please feel free to join us so that we can, you know, communicate and have a better flow and more ideas. Um, also, Michelle, I, I get this question too sometimes. Do you do you vary the times when you meet so people from different shifts can come? Yes, okay. we try to do that with all of our meetings um, in the building in general. Is uh, everyone's shifts are different? You know, we're a twenty-four hour care facility, and so we have people that come from six to two, and people come from two to ten, and. 10 to six. And so we try to do some in the morning or, you know, the next month we might do it later in the afternoon so that different people can come if they have the availability. So when, when do night shift people come if they come? Is it one of the <laughs> early morning or late afternoon? Usually if they, if the night shift does come, they come early in the morning okay, to the okay. morning ones. Yeah. yeah. It really works. Okay. And then how about uh, lessons learned in your two years? If you were to give, you know, what else? If you were to encourage um, a, a nursing home team listening to whether or not to do uh, an employee counsel, what would you, what would you give them? Um, I would just say definitely continue to um, advocate for more staff to be a part of it, more of your um, staff to provide feedback. And I think um, encouraging open voice. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times people are afraid to, they might not afraid, but maybe um, a little hesitant to say what they are feeling or what they heard or observed from staff. And this is one of those platforms to really be able to do that. Because like I tell people, we can't make a change if we don't know what we're doing wrong. We mm -hmm. can't make things better if we don't know what we're doing wrong, mm -hmm. um, just like anything in our lives. And so if if people use their voice and they speak up, whether it's on their own behalf or on someone else's behalf or on a smaller group's behalf, it's really beneficial. And so I think just really encouraging all of your staff to be a part of it. Nice. Yeah. Then, Michelle, I have a kind of like a deeper level question. I, I, I'm intrigued by this question myself. Um, uh, as you know, uh, you know, about culture change, we work together and a, a leader in the culture change movement challenged me by saying, in, in their opinion, employee councils are not necessary because in their very changed culture, they involve employees on every level, wherever decisions are being made. You know, and that is part of the movement to flatten management and to get more people who both live there and, and work at all levels. I, I hate the word level, but people who work with residents themselves they know stuff that maybe management doesn't, so that idea is flattening. And, and I guess if, if that culture can do that, great. <laughs> and, and so it's interesting to me, She, a friend of mine says, there should be no need for employee counsel. But I wonder if there is a need in some situations, if, if that's not happening, <laughs> you know, you represent a large community. Um, how many people live there? And remind people how big it is. And then what do you think of that comment? Please. Sure. So our facility, um, our home, we can have up to 100 and 216 residents living with us here. Um, and so, and then we also have our staff, which, you know, for Cherry Creek itself, we have about 200 employees. Yeah. But then we also, in, in our employee council and in our employee appreciation, we include our contracted companies, which is our therapy teams, our dietary team, and our housekeeping laundry team. So as a, co as a whole, it's about 300 plus employees. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we, are, we are very big, um, but it's important, I think, that we include everybody because we spend a lot of time here together. Almost, yeah. you know, a lot of times in, in our jobs, we spend more time doing that than with our families. So we really become a family. And so, you know, you wanna keep that work-life balance for people, but you also want to provide a space where people can, um, feel comfortable, but also still do their work. 
get the job done, but also making sure that we are comfortable, people feel safe, people want to continue being here and, and sharing their passion and continuing to, to drive for that. So, um, but in, in the context of the question, I think that employee councils can be beneficial. I think that, of course, it's hard for companies to think about merging departments. Um, a lot of times we do have silos in different places that we work, you know, so your leadership team and then everybody else. But I think that one of the struggles that a lot of places have is communication. The staff that don't, the staff that work closer to the residents are always going to know more than the leadership team does. <laughs> That's a given. The residents talk, staff talks, it, it, it's a given. But when you can have that easy flow of communication as a whole, that could be ben that can be very ben beneficial. And so maybe in an industry or maybe in a facility where there isn't that gap and where everybody has that consistent flow of communication, the same level flow of communication all the time, um, an employee council wouldn't necessarily be beneficial or help anymore, but I think for facilities that are working to get there, um, yeah. it would be really helpful to have an employee council um, so that staff can feel comfortable communicating on all levels with anybody in the building. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, there it is. Every team is different, every culture, every community, the size, yeah. and uh, it's ours to decide, right? Yeah, and, and I think that having such a diverse community, that's one of the benefits of Cherry Creek is we do have such a diverse community of residents and staff. And so our employee council having that idea and being able to communicate back and forth, well, you know, culturally, the, this is how things look and this culture sees things this way. And so being able to cohesively put those together and have that, that breeze in our in diversity is helpful. Yeah, you got that. Well, hey, Michelle, keep up the good work. I really appreciate you sharing. I'll let you know if I get any questions, if that's okay. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, thank you. Great. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So if any of you have questions for Michelle, I'd be happy to pass them on. And I would love to know, do any of you have employee councils currently? Have any of you ever worked with an employee council? And would you give any thoughts? Um, I'll, I'll keep moving on. but but I'll make time for comments and questions. We'd love to hear from anyone that has some experience, okay? So I'm just gonna share anything I've ever heard of. I, you kind of just heard me say that some cultures that are very changed and they flatten management. You see, we're talking about flattening management. They, they use language like high involvement. You want to use people who live there and work there at, in all decision-making. And, and see, those are the, the culture change friends who say, why would you need an employee council? Something else though I've learned everyone is sometimes when you're trying to change institutional culture, you start somewhere. And then maybe uh, years down the road, you don't need a practice that you did need at that time. Uh, so maybe an employee council now does make sense to give voice. And then I don't know, who knows what two or three years might look like differently. If we have more neighborhood councils, that's both residents and staff or more community uh, meetings, daily community meetings, perhaps it could happen. Uh, but if you're not there yet, it's just something to consider. Um, and then also um, my friend made the comment that you wanna do things together instead of being two-sided. So if you just ponder this for a minute, you know, resident council will sort of put residents I hate to say this, but it can be looked at like residents against staff, see? Maybe it looks like employees against leadership. I hate to say that, but that's what the institutional culture has done to us sometimes. So just be aware of that and talk about it. What approach might your group prefer? Maybe one idea is a stepping stone to another idea. It's totally up to you. Now, I don't really have time to discuss community meetings right now. Uh, it, it actually deserves it, its own webinar. And by the way, in March, we are going to have a conference, <laughs> a virtual conference. And guess what? The designer, the developer of community meetings, um, Barry Barkin has agreed to teach us in a two hour special webinar, 
in March. I don't have the date that he'll be speaking yet, but uh, we are putting the dates together. Hold on to your schedule in March. In fact, every Tuesday afternoon, 2 p.m. Mountain Time, every Tuesday, there's five Tuesdays in March. If you could block them out, uh, he'll be one of the speakers. And by the way, I should send an email out to everyone uh, encouraging you to block those days. Um, so just quickly, a community meeting is, is what it means. It's both the people who work there plus the people who live there. So together you make up a community and notice what the institution has done. We have resident meetings, resident activities, we have employee meetings, employees training, and rarely do we come together. The most I've ever heard is for the barbecues in the summer, which is great, but people smarter than me <laughs> realize if we come together more often, it will build community. And indeed it does everyone. If I had the pleasure of running a nursing home, let's say, I would do this. I would, I would bring community meetings and honoring sleep to the top, personally. So what do you do at a community meeting? You discuss whatever you wanna discuss. Um, certainly problems if you want to, but you also get to know each other and you celebrate life and you celebrate landmark life events for both the people who live there and work there, birthdays, anniversaries, getting married, someone tells a joke, someone gives a weather report, you involve the people who make up this community in any way you want. I'll tell you much more later, but the best is that I've ever seen is you start to make budget decisions, you start to um, talk about grievances that have been filed, you talk about the issues, and guess what? Homes that have done this, they don't have resident council anymore because this has become resident council. Dealing daily with an issue that happened yesterday is way more effective than a monthly resident council meeting. And if any of you want more information about that, let me know, especially the five uh, culture change project homes um, uh, during your monthly coaching calls. And see, notice what we've heard from both Desiree and Michelle is people want to feel heard, they want to belong, it's just natural. And these beautiful uh, practices are, are ways to do that. Here's another culture change practice also in the artifact, artifacts of culture change tool, the home welcomes and encourages team members, staff to dine with residents. Here's a wonderful story. I was there many years ago and they started a continental breakfast and they told team members have breakfast on us and go enjoy it with a person who lives here. And so they're honoring team members and they're also encouraging relationships. And notice, these are the things that people want in a workplace to have friendship, to have relationship. Uh, so there's the continental breakfast that day. Isn't that great? Um, here's another one. A home did a Wednesday buffet. And so anyone working on Wednesdays was welcome to eat lunch for free and sit down. First of all, help the residents you're sitting with get their meal. And secondly, sit down and dine with them. I was actually a surveyor uh, when I uh, saw this. And and it just warmed my heart to hear the buzz of conversation. Something I've realized because of this, everyone, when you sit with the same people every day, three times a day, you might run out of things to talk about. And so when you plop a new person in, particularly someone who works there, who probably is gonna help carry the conversation a little bit more, it can almost be noisy. And it's one of the best noises you'll ever hear. And, and by the way, you know, I used to say, hey, start small, you know, make it okay for a team member to sit down and at least have a cup of coffee. But I want to fast forward. In these days, when you're grasping to hold on, uh, free food might be a very simple thing that doesn't cost that much money for your home, and it might impact your retention and even recruitment. Another artifact or practice of culture change is a career ladder. So you, you create career ladders. People tend to, to hang out if there's some sort of a career path. And so we've called these lead CMAs. Um, uh, hang on, I've heard there's ladders sometimes. Um, and in this particular artifact, we are talking about a CMA, but of course, career ladders in other disciplines as much as you can. And then a separate practice would be that you support employees 
who want to further their education. You're going to help them with money, scholarships, um, helping them with different hours to attend uh, school, et cetera. Here's another one that might impact people, everyone, and that simply is taking away the requirement to wear the medical clothing. And so, you know, you, the way to start is to just make it an option. You don't have to wear the medical clothing if you don't want it. And I, I could not find my before picture. It makes me mad, but all these nurses used to wear lab coats, white lab coats. <laughs> it just blew my mind. This is only two years ago, let's say. And then they slowly, same home that Michelle is with, Cherry Creek, big nursing home, Aurora, Colorado, they slowly stopped wearing their scrubs. Um, and, and because people had the option, some people, you know, wore the scrubs, some people did not. And one thing we noticed was personality comes out when you can wear your own clothes. Now, if you're worried about dress code, everybody, everybody worries about it. And here's what I want to say. There's always a dress code wherever you work. If you work at the bank, there's a dress code. So you just make sure everyone knows what it is. And you, if someone violates it, here's the key. You, you, you simply talk to that person privately. You don't have to stop a practice, even though somebody doesn't follow it. In fact, that's the mark of an institution. We see a problem and we panic and we stop a good practice because someone didn't follow. No, you, you help and work with. Notice I'm trying to use softer words. You support this person, talk to them privately and remind them of the dress code so that this can take place for everyone else. It's a simple thing to do, and it really makes a, a difference in the culture. Uh, also, the whole idea of cross-training everyone to get more and more and more of us trained as CNAs is a good, good thing. Many professions have fought this, and it is time to stop fighting it, I, I believe. And, and let me tell you some good outcomes. There's a company in Kentucky called Signature Healthcare, for many years now, I bet you we're going on 10, they have done cross training. And you will actually hear people like the administrator say things like this, because this is what I've heard them say. I'm sorry, I don't have a video clip. I wish I did. The administrator holds the mic at a conference and says, I am a CNA and I'm very proud to be one. Why? Because I can help someone get in bed or help them get out of bed. And I can help them eat and I can help them, yes, go to the bathroom if need be. And I don't have to chase around and try to find a CNA. I can actually be helpful. <laughs> Isn't that great? So here's what I've learned, everyone. If you're not a nurse, a therapist, or a CNA already, volunteer to become a CNA. That's what leaders do. You become a role model for others to follow you. And to be honest, the way things are going, <laughs> it could also become a mandate by your organization anyway. Um, that's what places have realized. We've got to do something. Um, and it's okay. It's okay to be able to help people in lots of different ways. Think of the money that is spent to live in a nursing home. And if not everyone can, can help in as many ways as possible, we're really not living up to our desire to serve. Um, and these might be the days to do it. And, and don't panic, guys. No one's going to say, take a CNA shift. It's just that there are moments in time where it might make more sense to help someone in the bathroom right now than to run around and look for someone else, okay? That's all it is. Um, the next artifact or practice is team meetings um, are more specific. So for instance, huddles. Uh, a huddle, if you're not doing huddles, they are very effective. Um, typically like, uh, the, in my opinion, probably the most effective kind of huddle is let's say in the morning, there is a neighborhood huddle for the people who work on this neighborhood and from all disciplines. So sometimes we think of nursing only, like a shift huddle would probably be nurses and CNAs from one shift to the nurses and the CNAs to another shift. And that has its place, but it only represents nursing needs of people who live there, right? Whereas a morning team huddle with people from social services, uh, community life, um, dining, housekeeping, maybe environmental services. Now we really get a, a bigger picture of what's going on in this neighborhood and we can share information. Another neat practice is where leadership actually comes to the neighborhood huddle. And so someone from leadership is sharing stuff that each neighborhood needs to know. 
maybe the DON goes to one uh, neighborhood, the administrator goes to another, and leadership hears from each uh, group of employees what is needed in their neighborhood. And hopefully you all know that the word neighborhood has basically replaced the word unit because people live in neighborhoods they don't live in units. Um, other kinds of huddles, a post-fall huddle, having a huddle pretty close after a fall takes place tends to be an effective way of trying to figure out what just happened or any kind of incident, I suppose, post-huddle. Certainly any performance improvement project going on uh, for instance, we have higher infections on a certain neighborhood. And so we're going to have a huddle today and another huddle tomorrow <laughs> and figure this out. Really, you can do a huddle for anything. And they too represent real time communication. Uh, then we have the learning circle. Um, how many of you are doing the learning circle? And if you are not, highly recommend you consider it. Again, I don't have adequate time, but like in a nutshell, um, we purposely sit in a circle so that we all can be seen and heard. No one is standing, no one, no one purports to be in charge. Our backs are not to one another. And we pose a question for everyone to answer. And let me first say, this is a great way to simply get to know each other better. Um, you, you probably saw a few slides back, relationship is the key to changing culture. So the more you just get to know each other as people first, the better things will go. So notice, you can go around the circle and say where you were born. <laughs> and all of a sudden you, you know a little bit more about each other. It really feels so good. It's, it's amazing how simple it is. And then of course you can work yourself up to solving problems. And then uh, I hate to say there's rules. It doesn't sound right within culture change, but it's a good rule. And that simply is we don't talk <laughs> when someone else is talking. We actually listen. It could have been called the listening circle because when it's your turn, I'm not talking. And when it's my turn, you're not talking. And to be honest, it's hard for people because we, what do we wanna do? <laughs> we wanna say, oh, that happened to me. Oh, I went there. Oh, yes, you know, not yet. You just wait, wait, wait to hear from everybody. Then you have the group discussion. It's, it's kind of funny how it's even hard for us to wait. It's so funny, but it's so beneficial. You could just start with that little bit of, of instruction if you wanted to, because you start to hear from people. Notice what Michelle just said, we need more people to come, we need to hear from more people. And, you know, whether it's residents or staff uh, or a mixture, just, just starting to hear from each other more, that's why it's called a learning circle. And guess what? When you pose a problem to be solved, I could almost bet you money if I was a betting person, that by the end of a learning circle, you practically have a problem solved. That is the beauty of learning circles. And I give you a, a link there for some free learning circle information. All right, the idea of just promoting relationship. Uh, maybe team members are mentors to other team members. You have mentors in your culture. Residents could be mentors to other residents. Um, you know, elders, elders who live there could also be mentors to those of you that work there. Sages is a neat name that we've used. Look at this. There's an Asian saying that the future to all of us, we don't know what's coming, is sort of like walking backwards. That makes sense, doesn't it? And if we're all walking backwards, guess what? An older person has more to see. Therefore, they have a lot more to share from their life experience. Isn't that beautiful? Maybe, if nothing else, you could use the wise elders in your midst to speak into the lives of the people who work there. I found some uh, data recently, resiliency in older adults um, before COVID, let's look at this, uh, 25 seniors in rural areas over the phone, 20% were lonely before COVID and that continued after restrictions are lifted. Now that may not sound good, but it didn't go up. For most, the loneliness did increase within the first few months. Mobility impairment tended to impact this, um, but those who can reflect on how they coped in the past with some sort of isolation, growing up on a farm was an example, they more successfully managed this isolation during COVID. And then most returned to the pre-COVID levels of loneliness within six months, six to seven months. 
<laughs> Isn't that something? And in other words, older people have resiliency. And what a great idea to lean on them. I have a beautiful story, everyone. You will love this. Um, a nursing home in Colorado that became an Eden Alternative home. The Eden Alternative gives you 10 principles to start working on and change your culture. And look at what the director of nursing did. At every resident council meeting, the director of nursing would say to the people who live there, hey, residents, <laughs> hey, people who live here, don't forget to care for the people who take care of you too. Wow, every month, can you imagine? Hey, residents, hey, neighbors. Oh my gosh, you guys gotta take my pin. <laughs> hey, neighbors, don't forget to care for the people who are caring for you just as much. Wow, and, and here's the best part. I call it the full circle. I saw this director of nursing, Karen, in October many years ago. And she told me that her mom passed away in the summer. And then she said, do you know that in this month of October, I still have three residents, three people who live here, three neighbors who still check on me every morning to see how I'm doing. And I believe it's because she planted that seed that it's okay to care for each other. Isn't that gorgeous, beautiful, wonderful of Wyoming? If that's all you did out of this training today, it'd be great. And a, and a big name in the culture change movement, um, a pioneer in the Pioneer Network, uh, who actually worked at CMS, the federal government, who has brought a lot of change. Karen Shaneman has a sweet quote, those who serve our national treasures are themselves treasures. And that is you all on the phone right now, listening on the, on the Zoom. Um, some other data, everyone. This is older, but it doesn't matter because you still see it in the more recent data. Uh, what matters most to employees help with my stress and burnout. We heard this today. Uh, I am cared about, I am listened to, workplace is safe, supervisor shows appreciation and cares about you as a person. I've heard people say in this business, sometimes, um, some, sometimes employees just feel like my job is to do these tasks. I'm a task doer, um, I'm not treated like a person. Something else um, in a book called Meeting the Leadership Challenge, uh, uh, an administrator famous in our movement, uh, David Farrell says, the quality of the relationships we have with one another determines the quality of the care that we give. So another reason to build relationships with each other, have positive relationships, friendships equals better care. Another study, positive relationships with coworkers does end up having lower burnout risk. 58 studies were looked at, 19,000 employed people, 15 countries, um, how strongly people identified with their work colleagues or organization was associated with better health and lower risk of burnout. Good stuff. Did you know work friendships keep people in their present position for longer periods of time? It's estimated 30% more salary is needed to move on when the person is happy in their present position. Workplace relationships also impact the ability to succeed. Of course, when you have friends and good relations, you're more likely to be successful, feel good about yourself, do a good job, right? And another survey ended up saying that when I feel valued and I have a trusting relationship or more than one, uh, this will show high engagement. And they use the terms favorable attitude, intention to stay, and even a desire to advocate for your organization. So friendships at work equals people stay and feel more successful. Isn't that exciting? Another one, look, really recently. So I just looked up a few, I didn't take too much time, forgive me. I found one, uh, how to appeal to baby boomers at work. Look at this, prioritize your employees views toward continuing to work versus retiring, prioritize their views. What will keep them rather than retire? Wellness comes to the top, a workplace wellness program to be healthy and an age-friendly workplace. And I just, I get excited about this, everybody. Shouldn't we be about age-friendliness? <laughs> because we love people of older ages and now we have a lot of people living with us of younger age and the age of your workforce is a big variety. We should be famous 
for being age friendly, don't you think, for all ages? And then another really recent survey, Wyoming, you could do this, or more importantly, I would recommend each home listening do this survey the people who work there. And but a, a survey in Arizona not too long ago during COVID showed 21% were unsatisfied with being able to advance. And then 29% of those were likely to leave their jobs, whereas uh, 6% only wanted to leave if they were satisfied with advancement opportunities. So maybe some advancement opportunities are in line here. Uh, so consider elevating existing opportunities for advancement or creating new ones, be innovative. Um, then they also found out inadequate supervision was associated with higher intent to leave 19% of those who said their supervisors rarely provided positive uh, reinforcement, had higher intent to leave um, versus those who did get positive feedback frequently. So how supportive are your supervisory practices? It's kind of well known. People don't leave their job, they actually leave their supervisor. And 61% said they needed additional training in at least one topic. So maybe consider leveraging partnerships with training providers uh, widely disseminate online and in-person training. And here it is again, survey your own team and see what they need and what training they feel that they lack. Um, what data are you seeing? What are employees telling you? Uh, lastly, the Eden Alternative has a really neat, really neat suggestion. And they use a Jewish word called mitzvah. Mitzvah is um, the idea of of doing a kind deed without letting anyone know it was you. And it's the best way to warm up a culture. And so I would just close with, wow, what could you do personally without anyone knowing to warm up your culture? And I wanna thank our five homes, Powell Valley, Star Valley, South Lincoln, Granite and Polaris. Uh, they are the first round of five homes in the first year that are working hard on at least three culture change practices. By the way, by next April, we'll need another five. If you're interested, let me know. Our next webinar, September 24th, we'll, we'll now look at family councils and other ways to engage families. We've had that as a request twice. Um, please save the date, the last Friday of every month, 2 p.m. Mountain Time. And this is a big thing in Wyoming. We have two big audacious goals. Can you help us meet them? That everyone who works in a nursing home learns about culture change. These recordings, these webinars are recorded. You could play 15 minute chunks perhaps at different training opportunities. It's also a big goal to try to get to no person living in a Wyoming nursing home um, is woken up in the morning, natural awakening. How is that? How cool is that? Um, please join us in changing language. We don't say the F word anymore. <laughs> Facility, we refer to home and community in the name of your place. We're, we're using the term neighbor instead of patient or resident, even resident. Um, we're trying not to label people anymore. And we're trying to talk about individualized approaches more than the harsh word intervention. And thanks to Star Valley, you could join all of us in playing the game where you don't want to lose a pin if you say a word that you're trying to get rid of. So does anyone have any questions or thoughts? I'm looking in the chat box. Granite Rehab says, we are all cross-trained. And it's amazing. Our ED, activity director, myself, and the social worker are all CNAs. A few of us are cross-trained in three or four departments. It makes life a lot easier, and it helps with communications and department relations. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, and uh, any other thoughts or questions, questions, anyone? We have a minute. I'd really like to hear from you all. What do you think? What do you think? Anybody? Anybody have a minute? Oh, come on, Wyoming. Who's got a thought to share, a question to ask? Anybody, anybody? Okay, I'm trying to move on. We will close with these takeaways, I guess. Um, go to your employees, ask them what they need, just like you've heard today. Thank you, Desiree, so much for sharing. And thank you to Michelle in Colorado. Maybe just start talking. What are the pros and cons in your view of an employee council? What are some other thoughts for building relationship, high involvement, huddles, learning circles, community meetings, friendship? Um, maybe do your own short survey 
to get people talking and giving you ideas and what really is the pulse? Uh, what would keep people? And then consider maybe a word of the month or a word of the week if they're trying to change language. Uh, look at this little play on words, get the word out. <laughs> get the word out, we're changing words and we're getting words out, isn't that funny? Have fun with that. Bring up another game if anyone thinks of one. And then last but not least, let them emphasize the life that people are living more than the care they're receiving or the care that you are giving. And, and simply changing words, let alone practices that just keep us moving the pendulum where the focus is more about life, real life, normal life. Uh, the culture change movement has a quip they call, we're all about rampant normalcy. So thank you, Wyoming. Thank you everyone for joining us today. And we'll say goodbye now. Take care.